In rural Africa, did you know that many people have to walk over 12 kilometers a day to get fresh water for their families? Women and children typically bear this burden, walking four to six hours to and from a source that is likely contaminated and unprotected. This is also backbreaking work with the jugs of water weighing upwards of 20 kilos. And that those drugs are usually carried on their heads or on their back. In Africa alone, people spend 40 billion hours every year walking for water. And that time spent walking keeps children from school and women from uh, working and taking care of their families. Diseases from unsafe water and lack of basic sanitation kill more people every year than all forms of violence, including war. And children are especially vulnerable as their bodies aren't strong enough to fight diseases like diarrhea and dysentery. 90% of the more than 30,000 deaths that occur every week from unsafe water and unhygienic living conditions are in children under five years old. The WHO reports that this loss could be prevented uh, simply by improving water supply and uh, sanitation and hygiene. So when a, uh, an NGO designed a well that was not only inexpensive to make, but easy to use, it seemed like a gift and a breakthrough for the developing world. The NGO began building these wells in communities across Africa and health outcomes skyrocketed. A complete success, right? Well, maybe not. Because it turns out that these communities had another, uh, with the new wells also had another interesting skyrocketing statistic, domestic abuse. Because you see, it was the women that went to go collect the water every day, and they used that time walking together to chat and gossip and bond to form friendships and a support network. That walk was a vital part of their communities, not just because it provided them fresh water, but because it was a social foundation for the village. So when the men of the, of the villages could get the water themselves, that balance was thrown. And men didn't have the same respect for women anymore, and without the women's support network, things ended in violence. The designers of the well were so focused on its function, how cheap it was to make, how quickly it could be built, and how easy it was to use, that they forgot about its context. They focused their design efforts on the individual, on the user, uh, to making the well simple and accessible for all, but they didn't step back to see how their design would integrate into the larger community or culture. Had they taken the time to live with the communities in Africa and learn about every aspect of their culture and then design with those communities, they may have mitigated these unintended consequences. Never underestimate how much the people living with the problem already understand and can solve it themselves. These high school girls, for example, developed a power generator from found objects in their village that use an unlimited resource, urine, to, uh, to, to generate uh, electricity as a fuel. So it's pretty ingenious. But now, I'm not saying that we should totally forget about the user. The user is still incredibly important. But what I think is happening, as more and more people are learning about design thinking skills and incorporating it into their working processes, is that that focus on the wider culture and context is being left out. It's easy to teach, know your user. User research is cheap these days. And the idea of a customer-centric design is becoming more and more prevalent. But to teach know your users context, culture, and environment is a much bigger ask, and it can't be done in an afternoon in a usability lab. But I would argue that it's as important to know why someone orders a pizza as how they order it. And the funny thing is, is we've had the tools to integrate this type of, of research into design thinking for almost 100 years. It stems from a field of academia you may know of as anthropology. Anthropological research began much like market research is done today. A bunch of guys sitting in an office, sifting through data collected by other people to come up with insights. Back in the 1800s, anthropologists rarely visited the cultures that they were studying. It was too expensive and they didn't see the value in it. Why see a head on a living person when I can poke and prod it all I want here in a museum? Anthropologists would actually get their research from wealthy travelers and explorers. They published a sort of workbook called the Notes and Queries on Anthropology. It was probably about this size, and it was expected that people going to far off places would purchase a copy of the book, answer the questions in it while they were abroad, and then send it back to the anthropologist when they got home. It was like a public service for being, um, that came along with the privilege of traveling. Anthropologists would sift through these workbooks, 
to come up with insights that they would eventually use to publish in their research. Then this guy, Bronislaw Malinowski, comes along and basically calls bullshit on this whole thing. He's like, he attacks the inherent bias in this method of collecting data, ships off to Papua New Guinea to actually go live with the culture that he's studying, much to the chagrin of his fellow anthropologists. This was the birth of a research method called ethnography, or learning about and documenting a culture through long-term immersive observation. It's now a central practice in the field of anthropology. Originally, ethnographic research con uh, consisted of spending over a year with the group you were studying, where you become a member of the culture, learning the language and, and the systems. A, a year. That's very different from the current one-hour stakeholder interview that we currently use today on most projects. However, despite this treasure trove of information, the design community wasn't quick to pick up the benefits of ethnography and anthropology. In the past, designers uh, completed the tasks they were given very elegantly, but often they weren't given visibility into the greater strategy. So their designs would be elegant, but out of context. However, with the growth of the user experience capability in the digital sector, we're making headway. UX professionals actually think about the people that are going to be using and interacting with the experiences they design to make things useful and easy, like how do I make this credit card form super easy to fill out, or how do I streamline this news article so people actually read it to the end. This is the type of research that can be done in a usability lab, but where the problem arises is, is when this type of research is used to answer questions like what should my website do, or what new product should I make. And you simply can't get meaningful answers uh, to these types of big questions from talking to customers or stakeholders for an hour. True innovation needs more than that. There were, however, a few pioneers in the 1970s that began to think bigger. They're still in the minority, but they were the seeds of what is now known as a field of design anthropology. In California, Xerox Park opened a futuristic research lab called um, uh, Xerox Park, which stands for Palo Alto Research Center. And I know it's not much to look at, it's incredibly 70s, but there's a lot of really important things that happened here. Their focus was trying to understand how technology shapes us as a society, which went contrary to the prevailing sentiment that humans shape technology. Now let's think about that for a second. This, this upended the way that people were observing the world. This was relinquishing control of technology, that we were the ones architecting the experiences around these devices we were creating, and instead acknowledged that technology was fundamentally changing our communities and the ways we were interacting with each other. This, this was a big deal. The folks at Park would watch people in their office jobs for days looking for insights on how to better develop the technology products um, so they could make their work easier without any predilection on how that should be done. Questions like, how do office workers use their desk space? Or how does a centralized printer change office dynamics? Or how should a computer be designed to work in this new office environment? Some of their most famous accomplishments include one of the world's first personal computers, which looks an awful lot like a tablet. And they also designed the first laser printer, which integrates seamlessly into an office by looking like a fancy cabinet. Xerox Park also developed the computer GUI system that we know and use today. You know, the one with windows and icons and a mouse? That one. And look how happy they are with their new easy to use personal computer. By immersing themselves into the context of their users with no constraints over how or what they should design, Xerox Park created a serious amount of innovation in a very short period of time. Innovation that continues to shape the day-to-day -day world in which we live in now. At the same time, over in Germany, Hartmut Esslinger began thinking about and researching not only the, the context in which people were using the devices and, and products he was designing, but the emotions they were feeling while using them. He asked the question, how do families want to enjoy music at home? Or how can music be better integrated into life as it provides such happiness? He spent time with many different types of families, observing how music and entertainment fit into their life asking questions about when and why they listen to music and not just how they listen to it. And then he began his designing. And the result was the Sony Concept 51 stereo, which is now part of MoMA's permanent collection in New York. 
And instead of simply designing the best, most urban ergonomically friendly or easy to use record player or radio or tape deck, he created a device that had all three. It didn't matter if you were grandpa and liked your radio or dad and liked your records or you know a teenage kid collecting tapes, this was your music machine. And it was as future proof as it could have been in the 1960s. But more importantly, it was one device that met the music needs of the entire family or the entire household rather than the individual members of that family. And it sounds simple, and in many ways it is simple, but without Hartmut taking a step back and looking at that larger picture and understanding the family as a unit, it may never have happened. Designing for context and communities is simple when you think about it, and when you think about it, there are all these opportunities that, that appear um, out, out there. And exa one example I like to talk about is um, when I worked with Janssen Pharmaceuticals HIV team a couple years ago. Uh, their challenge to us was this, adherence. Patients weren't staying on their medications. Um, and HIV meds are weird ones. They actually make you feel sick before you get better. Um, to prevent you from developing AIDS. So HIV positive patients often wouldn't take their meds because they didn't feel like they had to. And on top of that, the director of Janssen int was intrigued by the idea of wearable tech. So he challenged us to leverage that in, um, in our new solution. We approached the challenge by designing a wristband that buzzes when you need to take your medication and monitors your T-cell count. It syncs to your smartphone and notifies your doctor when you haven't taken your meds or when something goes wrong and maybe it even looks something like this jawbone. So it's in sync with trends, it leverages technology well, and solves a problem. Great, right? Yeah. Nah? Yeah? yeah. Except, except no. <laughs> because uh, when we actually talked to HIV patients, the challenge wasn't so much forgetting to take your meds, though that was part of it, but rather they didn't feel like they had to because after a few months of being on the meds, they felt healthy again. So we brought patients into our lab to talk to them and discover how important their support network was. So we had, and then we adapted the wearable tech program to include support triggers from family, friends, and carers. This way, we connected with the users and made our, tr our product truly user-centric. Now we have a winner, right? Mm -hmm. But then the product fails. Why? Well, by bringing those end users out of their context and out of their environment and out of their lives, they didn't tell you the whole story. You didn't realize that not all carers and family members are engaged with the patient's HIV. You don't see the fear and the embarrassment of HIV patients talking about their, um, their illness in public, and you don't see the stigma in the outside world of having HIV, and that putting a bright red wristband that flashes and beeps and vibrates is just like announcing to the world, don't come near me, I'm HIV positive, which is exactly what they didn't need. Now, luckily, things didn't pan out like this in real life. We mitigated those unintended consequences with tools like rapid ethnography, or getting out there and actually spending time with our users, shadowing them, observing them, and hanging out with them in context. We'd stay with them all day or even all week. We wanted to see them is in as many contexts as possible, at the doctor's office, at home, and out and about. But our engagement with them didn't end there. We also involved them in the design process. We'd brainstorm ideas with them, bring them prototypes, and solved challenges together. This is a method that's known as co-design. And it brings the design process and the actual problem-solving activities into the context of the user. Ideally, this happens in their homes or in the environment you're designing for so that it feels real to them. By bringing our patients out of a lab, the solutions became more tangible and more relevant to users' lives. Through this process with Janssen, we actually ended up creating an HIV program for patients that was almost completely non-digital, a buddy program. It, it pairing patients up with someone who was going through the same thing, and it gave a support network to those who didn't have one and a resource for those who did, and it's currently being tested today. Many companies have already started to think about design, process, uh, design anthropology and incorporate it into their, um, into their designs. They've realized the benefits of ethnography and co-design aren't just about mitigating unintended consequences, but also uncovering market-changing opportunities. Intel now employs 24 ethnographers who help design a community computer for a rural Indian village that has 
um, that runs on a car battery and has a very strong dust filter. It's a product that the communities and Intel co-designed together. Carlsberg Beer also employed a design anthropology firm to help them with their marketing strategy. The team spent two months undercover talking with bar owners all over England and Finland to see how Carlsberg was being integrated into their bars. And what they found completely upended Carlsberg's marketing strategy. All of the millions of dollars Carlsberg spent on creating promo materials like coasters and ashtrays and decor, while accepted by the bar owners, was usually thrown unopened into cupboards. Why? Well, because the promo material was bright green. And for a bar go, trying to go for a more subtle ambiance, it totally clashed. The researchers learned that bar owners take great pride in their bar's look and feel. And even though they like the free stuff, they wouldn't use it. To develop the solution, Carlsberg brought bar owners into a co-design workshop. And what resulted was a set of products that bar owners could customize to match their bar. Had they simply asked the question, how do we make our ashtrays better, they would have never discovered this unmet need. Through the undercover ethnographic research, the team also discovered that their Carlsberg beer promo girls, while very successful at selling beer, were hurting their brand image and the larger bar industry. The girls in skimpy outfits would get harassed on the job, which led to low job satisfaction, which led to high turnover, which meant their level of experience and product knowledge about Carlsberg was really low, which meant the bar owners would get frustrated with them and thought they had little to no value, which ended up in really poor brand perceptions. Talk about a chain of unintended consequences. So Carlsberg replaced their beer girl program with a training academy for aspiring bartenders and barbacks. The program shifted perceptions about the Carlsberg promoter role and professionalized the work for individuals who hadn't previously seen it as a long-term career. But my favorite example is actually Huggies diapers. And it's not just because I get to put cute babies up on the screen, but Huggies spends millions of dollars every year on product research. They bring babies into play labs and have them run around and jump on things and move every which way with a very, very full diaper just to make sure that the diaper is leak proof from every angle, no matter what the, um, the load size is. <laughs> and, but even though they had the most technologically advanced diaper on the market, sales were still plateauing. They'd solved the technical problems of their product, but something was missing. So they sent a team of design anthropologists to observe families and set up cameras in homes to see what they could uncover. And what they discovered was a stigma around diaper use after a certain age. Parents felt ashamed if their kid was in diapers too long. And that question, is your child still in diapers, was absolutely agonizing for them. So with this in mind, Huggies designed diapers that didn't look like diapers. They looked like underwear. They still had all the scientifically tested protection of their diapers, but without the same t sound or telling look. Needless to say, sales improved rem remarkably and new products were spawned, but some were more successful than others. And uh, of course, there was some backlash from the hipster parent community who went for style over safety, but to each parent their own. You feel free to, to listen to your users' insights or not. So I'd encourage you, all of you to at least try to bring some of these elements of design anthropology into the work that you do. There's a direct correlation between the time spent with your users and the insights gathered. The longer we spend getting to know our users, the better our solutions become, which is why we're so good at designing for ourselves. We spent years with ourselves. You can see this in the startup and tech communities especially. How many products are designed to work for the tech-savvy geeks of the world and do, but then fail when pushed to the general public? In my version of the perfect world, we'd all have unlimited time and, research, uh, time and resources to do this type of research on every single project, but we all know that that's not gonna be possible. We can't spend a year, but surely we could spend a week. And we can't spend every moment designing in context, but we could hold a few workshops. Remember, you can't come up with new concepts from old observations, so make research an integral part of every project that you do. Get out there with your users and your customers and get in their element and see, see them in all the context you can. Maybe even use this little book to write down some of your observations. 
and then you could mail it back to me so I could pour through its contents and come up with some innovative ideas. No, I'm kidding. But do take a look at that larger picture than the one you've been asked to solve. You might be solving the wrong problem. Um, and design with your users, in their situations, with their materials, but don't be prescriptive in your solutions. Your users probably know more about their own challenges than you ever will. So in your next project, go try some of these concepts out, even just a little bit, and see what you learn. And I'll bet you'll be surprised at how successful your new product is when you take a step back and just watch. Thank you.